Good morning, all who are with us here and those who are worshiping with us on our YouTube channel. Welcome to you all. This is the fifth Sunday in Lent. We are just one week away from Palm Sunday and Holy Week and two weeks from Easter Day, which we will be most thankful to celebrate this year. So as we settle in, this being Lent, we begin the service with a penitential order. And so we'll just uh, find a moment to gather and center ourselves uh, before we continue and just to settle in to worship God and just to be with one another again. Welcome all. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. With you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path of mighty waters, who brings our chariot and horse, army and wa warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me the jackals and the ostriches. 
For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drinks to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 126, found in your bulletin and on page 782 in the Book of Common Prayer. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses of the Negev. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. The second reading today comes from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews as to the law of Pharisees, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. 
Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Then Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. There are moments in today's readings when I feel as if we are continuing a conversation that began last Sunday when we listen again to the beloved parable of a father who was overjoyed to see his son again, a son who he thought was lost, but then was found. I pointed out that the word prodigal as not meaning lost, but someone who spends wastefully or recklessly, as in a son who asked for his early share of an inheritance and then spent and lost it all. Another meaning for the word is lavish or extravagant, as in the ice cream sundae was topped with a cherry and a prodigal quantity of chocolate syrup. <laughs> so, there's our word study for the day. Uh, today we hear in our gospel another extravagant act. Now whether or not it was wasteful is clearly in the eye of the beholder, Mary sister of Martha and Lazarus, in the middle of dinner, took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. Judas thought the act wasteful, wastefully prodigal. Jesus saw it as an expression of love and preparation for what would come. Mary used the same kind of perfume that the women carried to the empty tomb that they thought would be Jesus ready for his burial. So much of what we see and what we experience in life hinges on our perspective and our point of view. Context always matters. Now when Jesus said, you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. We have to read the room and that moment to fully understand what he might have meant. There are simply just too many verses in the Bible that call for the care of the poor for us to conclude that Jesus was being insensitive here. So, what did he mean? When I look back on two years ago, in my shortened trip to the Holy Land, the three days I had on the ground was spent sort of running around, right in Jerusalem. And one side I was able to get to and see was to stand on the Mount of Olives, looking over the Kidron Valley and the Garden of Gethsemane and over at the Temple Mount. And just turning a little to the east, over the hill was Bethany, known today by its Arabic name. What impacts pilgrims and visitors is how close Bethany is to Jerusalem, just beyond the city walls, a short walk. Now, seeing a holy site is a privilege, and it can allow one to go back through time, yet sometimes I think an even more powerful way to travel is to kindle our imagination. 
our imagination to smell. And one does not have to travel at all to do this. We often remember, don't we, through smell and taste. And the detail that I love in John's telling is how so much nard was spread and poured on Jesus' feet that the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, I wonder why even mention that. It was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So I ask you, what are the smells that allow you to remember places and people? What are those smells? I remember vividly my great-grandmother's house in Michigan. Her father was born in Poland, and she always seemed to me to be cooking in her small house. And I am convinced to this day that the entire block smelled of sauerkraut. <laughs> and when she would hug and squeeze me, she would smell of sauerkraut. And to this day, when Leslie tells me, oh, order the Reuben on the menu, it's really good, I can't <laughs> because of my beloved Polish-American great-grandmother ruined sauerkraut forever for me. This is where I go. I can still remember the popular perfume of the 1960s and 70s that seemed to fill our house, especially at Christmas time. It was Charlie for my mother and anything the Avon lady came and sold at the door. And my father and grandfather were loyal to Aramis. And so those smells still are so powerful to me. They evoke memory and place that I will occasionally dab on a couple drops of, of Aramis, not Charlie, but Aramis. <laughs> and an instant I am back with those people, those flawed, loving, and very human people who formed me. So I invite you, maybe during this week, to think about those smells and those tastes of yesterday that filled your homes and your houses and maybe the streets you knew. And the reason is because so much of what we do when we try to hear these stories from the Gospels is we try to put ourselves in them, put ourselves in the setting and make room to learn and see something. And this is especially true for Holy Week that comes in just one week away because on Palm Sunday and all of these days we try to put ourselves into the scene. And this is much more than just about evoking memory and being nostalgic. I think it can make us attentive to what is right before us. And I think that is what the gospel is pointing to. So I have learned many things in these weeks living with the art and the life of Vincent van Gogh. And I saw how he moved from failing to become a pastor that he thought he was called to be to becoming an artist. And he never ceased to preach the gospel with his art. And he viewed Christ as the perfect artist and the perfect gardener. And his sadness and his brokenness were real and painful. And there were moments when pure glory came out of his art. He painted from his memory, looking into the night sky, his most famous painting, Starry Night, that we'll look at a little bit later today. And he looked out through the bars of his asylum window and was able to paint this wonderful painting, giving the world a glimpse of God's glory. And Van Gogh reminds us that the world today is filled with ordinary wonders. In his day, it may have been a simple family seated around a table eating steamed potatoes or maybe a bunch of sunflowers or a pair of mud-encrusted shoes or a tree blossoming in spring or looking up into the night sky. So for us, we can be inspired because we live in a world full of pain and confusion, 
and fear and uncertainty. And there is still so much beauty to see. So let's go back to that house in Bethany, full of people and food and smells. Mary's act of perfuming the feet of Jesus and using her own hair to wipe his feet, it really made head spin. It was outrageous. It was embarrassing. It was inappropriate. It certainly was extravagant. What did Judah say? He criticized Mary. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Leave her alone. We're reminded of another visit Jesus made to that same house just so close to Jerusalem. And Mary again is sitting at his feet. And Jesus turned to the dutiful sister and said, Martha, Martha, you may know this verse, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing, and Mary has chosen the better part. Jesus speaks to us through time, all those of us who are worried and distracted by many things. To be fully present in the moment is perhaps our greatest challenge. I know it is for me, but it is also God's greatest gift. Of course, one person's wasteful spending can be seen by another person as an extravagant gesture. Some might say, and some do say, why do Christians spend so much money to care for such lavish buildings and purchase such grand musical instruments? Sorry, Bruce. <laughs> or to pay for their clergy? Sorry, me. But twisting Jesus' own words against Jesus about the poor is probably not the best way to get at the heart of this. One answer to this might be for us in doing what we do is that we are because we gather. Each week on Sunday, the Christian Sabbath, we gather in a place and over the past few years, we've had to learn to do this in different ways. But there is no technology that can take the place of human bodies gathered around an altar. Like biblical Israel, the church is a community, not a collection of soloists or hermits. And there is no DYI, do-it-yourself Christianity. We know we are stronger when we're together and not separated. This morning we hear another case about loss and gain. Notice how before he became Paul, the great apostle, he was Saul. And the old Saul had deep religious bona fides that he lists without shame or apology in Philippians circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. It lists like a resume. He was spotless in his background. But still, even for Paul, then Saul, there was a hole deep inside of him, too deep for all of that to fill. Paul did not so much reject his faith that formed him, but he found in Jesus Christ the only way to make sense of it. He was willing to lose what he thought had defined him in order, in his words, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. So I hope we're hearing again and again something, that being found, being known, being loved, in place of searching the world over to find, to know, and to love may be the better way. After two years of dislocation and isolation and distancing and a whole lot of fear of the known and the unknown, I think we long for meaning and community and hope and rest and peace and a fresh start and a new beginning 
What was it again that Jesus said? Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. So in the spirit of Mary of Bethany, what is it before you that needs your attention? In the spirit of Paul, who gave us words that might help us move into the future, hear these words again, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus Christ. So we are to press on and to move forward. And maybe that's enough for now. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May we affirm our faith together in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of Prayers of the people, sisters and brothers, the Lord has done great things for us. With glad and thankful hearts, let us pray, fix our hearts where joy is found. Lord, hear our prayer. Do a new thing in your church, O Lord. From our dry places spring forth new life. Refresh your bishops, priests, and deacons. Refresh all Christians in their vocations. Fix our hearts where joy is found. Restore the dreams of those who have lost hope. Among the swift and varied changes of the world, be a strong foundation on which all can rely. Fix our hearts where joy is found. Give water in dry places. Remove the suffering of those who live with drought. Bring water, quench thirst, and give growth in desperate lands. Fix our hearts where joy is found. We pray, O God, for the poor. Be merciful to victims of theft. Restore the fortunes of those devastated by dishonest men and women. Never forget the lives of your poor. Fix our hearts where joy is found. 
Let those who sow with tears reap with songs of joy. Restore your people, O Lord. Fix our hearts where joy is found. O oh God, we long to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Even as we share in his suffering, even as we die, may we and all who die attain the resurrection of the dead. Fix our hearts where joy is found. We pray for those on our ongoing prayer list, praying for Tom and Pat and Scott Lee and Joseph, Jean and Frank and Martha and Lang and David, praying for those either silently or loud for those for whom you are praying. And we remember those who have died. O oh Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please be seated. Just a, a brief word, uh, again, next week, uh, Palm Sunday is upon us. Weather permitting, we're going to gather in the courtyard. I know many of you will, will be here keeping everything uh, ready for us, uh, but if you are able to join us, uh, dress warmly, and we'll bless the palms out here in the courtyard and, and process in and distribute those palms. So we begin Holy Week in that uh, tradition and we look forward to, to Palm Sunday and into Sunday's uh, Easter day. Uh, if you are able to join us for our last Van Gogh Forum immediately following uh, this service, and we are hoping on Easter day that we will rekindle a tradition here of an Easter day breakfast between the services, and to do that we need two things, people and food. Uh, and you're the people, and you have to bring the food. Um, that's how it works, very simple, and we hope it'll be very wonderfully fragrant and, and wonderfully smelling eggy, bacony food. So, uh, my favorites. No sauerkraut. No sauerkraut, no cabbage. All right, let's list those things I don't like. All right. <laughs> uh, but it is April, the first Sunday of April, and so we... Um, we lift up those who are celebrating April birthdays. And the only thing you have to do is you come forward and you can say the day of the month you were born. No age, except when you're super young. So anyone have an April birthday? Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their heart may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. What day of the month will I come?
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into new covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory, giving himself freely to death on the cross. He triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share in these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now, as Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another. You have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world. 
and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Look with compassion, O Lord, upon this your people, that rightly observing this holy season, they may learn to know you more fully and to serve you with a more perfect will. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.